Good morning. This morning I'm going to be talking about transformation and light. First I'll talk about light. Then I'm going to be talking about how light affects or brings in transformation. And then I'll be talking about the process of transformation and what we need to do to promote it. Um, some of this talk this morning is pretty esoteric. What I ask you to do is to keep an open mind. Don't let your concrete mind jump in and say, where is that over here or here or here or gosh, I don't see how that could happen. You know, if, if that's the approach you take to listening to the talk this morning, you'll zone out. You'll just zone out. So, so what do you do? It's like <clears throat> when I first learned about some of these ideas and experiences, uh, they were so new to me. Uh, but I was excited. I said, wow, is this really possible if you're on the spiritual path? And so I didn't have doubt I, I didn't try to research medical records to, uh, to prove it. Uh, I just accepted it, some people would say, on faith. You know, I accepted it because I believe so much in the teachings and those who gave us the teachings that it never dawned on me to even question, you know, what was happening. And then later on, I had the experiences that I read about. So that was great because then it didn't throw me off into, uh, you know, fear and doctors and concerns that I was dying or losing it or was becoming insane. You know, <laughs> I know. So uh, anyway, I'm really excited to share this with you this morning. And to have you begin to think about uh, what light is and how striving evokes transformation. The, the term transformation in the teachings, uh, we read about it a lot. Uh, transformation, trans this and trans that, you know, <laughs> sublimation, transfiguration. And it's, for a while, it's just, these are just words. You know, and then sometimes we just gloss over the word without really thinking, what's behind this word? What is behind transformation? What is behind transfiguration? Meaning, uh, how do we experience it? And if we experience it, what does that mean? So I hope this morning's talk is going to bring a lot of these ideas together and your questions answered and you're going to see how great it is to know about these teachings, to be on a spiritual path and um, to understand why tests are very much a part of you know everybody's life. And so this is why Richard this morning read uh, Torquem's poem on tests. So, let me start with this. The Tibetan Zhuo Kul frequently talked to his students about the light in the head. And I know you have all read about this, the light in the head. So what does it mean? You know, what is the light and how does it manifest? These are valid questions. The Ageless Wisdom teaching tells us that light is the result, light is the result of radioactivity that is coming from the fire that is within each atom. Actually, it's within any life form. The origin of all life is fire. See, this is another thing, another idea or concept that is difficult for some people to comprehend because they don't have 
the, the psychology or the science or the experience of what it means. But it is there and it's meaningful and it's significant to your own life, to the life of your spouse, to the life of your children, uh, just to life in general. So uh, try not to reject or be resistant. Uh, just you know, be open to the idea that the origin of all life is fire. You can read more about this in The Sacred Doctrine. Uh, Blavatsky talks a lot about fire and life, and uh, certainly Agni Yoga, which is the yoga of fire. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of teaching uh, for us to delve into. And, and I'm just trying to um, condense it and like, basically give an introduction you know, to these ideas that hopefully will inspire you to aspire. The light in the head, the light in the head, is a diffused light or glow from our physical etheric atoms. Now just stay with me on this. Our brain is composed of physical and etheric atoms. So it is the physical and etheric atoms which has to do with the phenomenon of light. Okay, now this light you can experience, it's like a diffused light, you can experience in three different stages. And the first stage is where you're really going to experience the light in the head. It's a diffused light, but it's like you may be out walking in nature, you may be engaged in study of something very lofty, you may be in meditation, or you may be in sleep where you become aware of this light in the head. And that's what's called the first stage. The second stage, the light becomes brighter uh, and very distracting. And this is when many people go to the doctor, have an MRI, uh, you know, and, and the medical profession has you convinced that you may have a tumor uh, or other problems going on until they take the MRI and there's no tumor. You know, and, and then they'll diagnose you with something and give you something and, <laughs> you know, you know, I do encourage, it's always good to see your doctor and make sure that uh, it is not something, you know, medical. But once you re have that done and you realize it's not medical, then you're going to know, okay, this is this increasing light in the head, which is the second stage, is the result of transformation. It's the result of spiritual striving. The, the teaching says that the second stage uh, is when our human soul is making contact with the etheric light and that it is called the sun in the head. So that's a phrase that the teaching has given us with this for the second stage of light. The light is increasing. This is when the soul has made contact or a connection with the etheric light and it's called the sun in the head. Now the third and later stage occurs when the bright electric light is experienced. So by now you've had enough experience with the first two stages that you're not frightened and it makes sense to you and it's very revelationary uh, and it's this, this bright electric light uh, actually has an effect on every cell and every atom of your body. You're um, making contact with higher fires and the result of this contact then 
precipitates into your aura and into all the cells and atoms of your body and transformation begins to take place. It's an actual phenomenon. It's not something that you can read about and say, oh, this is me. It's something you can read about and say, hmm, I haven't had that experience, but maybe I will. Or you read about it and 10 years later say, oh, I remember that. And this is what I'm going through right now. And it's okay. Particularly spiritually, it's very good. With this bright electric light, there is an interplay between the light of your solar angel and your etheric and atomic light. It's the interplay between the light of the solar angel and your own physical, etheric, and atomic light. Now, not everyone who has attained an advanced stage of consciousness will necessarily see this brain radiance. It's very interesting. Um, all, eventually, ultimately, you will, but maybe not initially, maybe not in the first two <coughs> stages. It depends on your physical body, it depends on your past karma, and it depends on the degree of spiritual achievement. So all those three points, it's like, again, it depends on the receptivity of your physical body, the capacity that your physical body uh, has, and then your past karma, and then your achievements. So those are the three um, qualifiers uh, that determine whether you're going to be able to see one, two, or the third stage of these, this diffused light. Now, um, the other point is, do you have the ability to bring down and regenerate these higher fires? Absolutely, everybody does. But it's not spontaneous unless you have gone through these experiences life after life after life. When a person is going through what we call the recapitulation stages, um, you can experience the first, the second, third stage of the light in the head uh, rapidly or over a period of one to three to five years. And with each stage, there's like this automatic knowingness, what we would call instinct perhaps, but it's part of your memory, your atomic memory, that it's like makes this announcement, now is the time, now you are ready, now you are prepared again in this life to bring down the higher fires. And that in itself is, is um, oftentimes brought about by who you are in contact with. If you are in contact with an object, if you're in that's been worn by an enlightened being, then you're making a contact with the energy of that object and the energy of the person who wore it. And it evokes the higher fire, which then instinctively you know what to do with. It's, it's really amazing. And I'm going to go over that again when I get to another part of the talk. So the idea is that we're going to bring down higher fires and regenerate these fires, you know, into our aura and into our system. For example, when the creative activities of a spiritual person, an aspirant or a disciple, has activated their heart and throat centers. Now this is another point It's important to remember, heart and throat centers. When these two centers are activated, <clears throat> what takes place is that there is an interplay of energy or an interplay of fire between 
these two centers, the heart and the throat center. And the result of the interplay uh, manifests through your creative endeavors, whether it is singing or writing or uh, leading in some capacity, uh, or even working on the, uh, working is a strange word, uh, participating in interplane events. It all begins as a result of regenerating the fires from on high, activating the heart and the throat centers with this interplay. When, when this interplay between the heart and the throat centers takes place, you're making contact with higher atomic fire. Now, when I'm talking about atomic, most of you know I'm talking about permanent atoms. Uh, permanent atoms that we all have in our various physical, etheric, emotional, mental, intuitional bodies. There are permanent atoms there. And these, it's like this is the most advanced uh, element in that part of our nature. Um, we have a physical permanent atom. That's the most advanced element of our physical body, physical etheric body. And when this advanced element is activated, more fire and light is released, and we begin to live a more purposeful life. In these permanent atoms resides the plan of our soul. Uh, so that the purity of this plan is not recognized or lived until you have continuity of consciousness. Up until that point, it's like trial and error. You know, you tap in and then you tap out and then you mess it up a bit and, you know, have to work out that mess and, uh, and the working out of that mess is called striving. Okay, when the heart and throat centers make, are activated and uh, connect with the corresponding advanced atomic fire, this is when you begin to experience the light in the head. The interplay of energies evokes a response from within your chalice. If, if we had a screen and PowerPoint or a whiteboard up here, I might be able to draw it a little bit, you know, not being an artist. But you just, you know, I'm trying to convey these images as I'm talking. So just be open and receptive to the image that's being put out there. And you can you know, realize this chalice that's in your higher mind is now the core, the nucleus, the, uh, actually it's the knowledge and love petals are being stimulated. And it's all the result of your striving, which results in transformation, uh, which results in uh, the various stages of light manifesting in the brain. I hope that's clear. The nucleus of the chalice, and this, let me, oh, this is, it's easier to know it than to speak it. Um, so, so we have the nucleus of the chalice. The nucleus of the chalice is actually your divine spark, or also known as your soul, your unfolding human soul. Okay, so your unfolding human soul is waking up now uh, to its true purpose. Uh, you have more energy than you've ever had before uh, that's coming into your nature, changing your beingness, all the, which is the result of the stimulation of the unfoldment of the love and knowledge petals. This then evokes the higher fires. Higher fires would be coming from your um, 
initially from the mental permanent atom, which is part of your higher consciousness, your higher mind. Once that mental permanent atom is activated and all the beauty and magnificent and the frequency of energy that is manifesting little by little by little from the mental permanent atom, then through the law of attraction, magnetic attraction, it be also begins to activate what we call the spiritual triad and the atoms of the spiritual triad. Okay. <laughs> In order for our human soul to evolve and to return to the Father's home, our unfolding human soul must pass through various stages of the fire of transformation, the stages of enlightenment. So what I've just given you is a process that will take place once you put yourself in a committed relationship with your soul and the purpose of your life, then life or incarnation after incarnation after incarnation, this whole process of transformation and the increasing fires takes place. So it, the fire regenerates yourself typically around the age of seven and then you begin to spiritually advance and move forward. When our consciousness progresses, we need higher fires. It would be like, as an example, let's say that uh, you have a child that is born as a genius, and yet you put him through a public school system first grade, second grade, third grade, with less than adequate teachers, this child is going to be nothing but a problem child for you because he or she needs to be placed in an environment appropriate see, to the fires, those higher fires that his genius brought in with him in this life. So that's why we need higher fires and why we need to live progressively. Because by living progressively, this fire produces greater light. And we get closer and closer and closer to the purpose of living the purpose of our life. The greater a person's light, the more radioactive his creative nature will be. Creativity is the ability to contact higher fires and express them through a pure mechanism which will not distort the light but keeps its true expression. Now I'm gonna to try to stick with my notes here or I'll never get through everything. So I'll see if I can do this. Um, okay, the light. Let me go back to the light and higher fires. Uh, we have to have a pure mechanism so we do not distort the light coming to us from the higher fires. Again, this is striving. We have to change. If we want to change our beingness, we have to undergo purification exercises. Or you're going to find yourself in trouble. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll pick that up in a minute. Um, the light released from the higher fires manifests through all of your thoughts and creative forms. For example, if you come in contact with the creative form of an enlightened one, like I was talking about earlier, your inner fire will be affected by the fountain of light of the enlightened one's consciousness. And when you are in that environment, in that atmosphere, you will have, <clears throat> you will experience 
moments of an elevation of consciousness. And I know you've been there. And it's, it's not somebody standing up at a podium or in front of 5,000 people saying, you know, I am an enlightened one. It is not that. Because not all such people are enlightened. They're just good speakers, you know. <laughs> and they have a lot of knowledge, brain knowledge. But they're not yet enlightened. You will know it may be a one-on-one -on -one experience with the most humble person ever. And you're going to have a moment where your consciousness is altered. And you will, at that moment, experience for the first time, perhaps, uh, the light in the head. That can be one of the experiences that uh, it expands your consciousness. You can have, oh, I'm moving away from my talk. Um, let me bring it back, because it's so exciting to, you know, to have this spiritual awareness and knowledge. And it makes all these tests that you go through worth it and understandable. OK, um, so you're with an enlightened one. Or you may be wearing an object that an enlightened one war, or you may be holding it in your hand. And for a moment, just for a moment, you're going to have an elevation of consciousness. It may um, present many, many of your incarnations to you. Uh, it may, um, like the parting of the, the fires where you go into the subtle worlds, uh, and have a touch and of what it is, uh, what life is, you know, in the universe. The, and then you come back, you know, to the planet, and you're never the same. Now you have something you desire and you yearn for, and you want to experience it again. The elevation of consciousness at that moment produces a spiritual tension. If you can sustain this spiritual tension, if you can sustain the light, the power, the energy of that moment, you're going to create a cellular and atomic transmutation. And sustaining this means spiritual tension, creating a cellular and atomic transmutation, and this produces transformation. To sustain the spiritual tension requires a change in your beingness, a change in your beingness. To understand this, to define the level of your beingness means a percentage of mastery that you have achieved over your physical, emotional, and mental bodies. And for some, even the more refined bodies, like the buddhic body, the intuitional body. It is the percentage of transformation you have carried out within your vehicle. When you come in contact with the radiation emanating from that object or from that enlightened being, you are coming in contact with higher atoms, the fire of higher atoms. Atoms which, um, pers let me say, which possess virtue, possess wisdom, and possess truth. When your fire unites with the radiation of the fire in higher atoms, it initiates transformation. See, transformation and light. That's the title of the talk this morning. <laughs> transformation elevates your beingness if you are able to, and this is the key, sustain the note of the transforming energies. And I could speak 
hours about what happens if you don't sustain it, as well as what happens if you sustain these energies. There, but I'm not going to. So the result is <laughs> recognized. How do you recognize this? It's through the gradual change in your behaviors. Why is that? What is happening? Your light is increasing. You can't just stand up there in front of those 5,000 people, say, I'm a different person, when they know you're the same. When you come in contact with the spiritual fires of a higher realm, that light released from that realm enters into your aura, where it begins to transform the substance of the centers in the fourth and the third and the second and the first levels of your etheric body. Your body is surrounded with a web of light, which gives life to your body. This is the etheric body, and it's formed from the substance of these four higher planes. Now, let me take a moment. I wasn't going to say this, but I think I'd better. That, first of all, these, um, Oh, I'm so out of time, and I'm so sorry about this. Uh, when I talk about the, the fourth, third, second, first levels of the etheric body, I'm also including the corresponding higher ethers. Okay, now what happens? Some people have a loose etheric body. And this is something if you are a spiritual teacher, a spiritual leader, even um, an advanced medical person, you need to be aware of these things. That some people have a loose etheric body which is related to your nervous system and your senses. What happens when you have an, a loose etheric body which it typically uh, begins to disconnect from the base of the spine, the soul, your human soul, can move out of the body, out of your physical etheric body, and you can begin to have communication with entities in the etheric plane and the astral plane. The problem with this is that this energy is registered improperly by the brain. It's registered improperly by the brain if this etheric body has become loosened. Okay, and then you begin to have problems with the nervous system and you become a victim of apparitions and so forth. It's, it's a very serious situation, obviously. Um, and if you know somebody that this has happened to, you have to tell them immediately to cease and desist from any kind of meditation whatsoever. They must be treated by a psychiatrist. Be, not, not that the psychiatrist is going to change the nature of the etheric body but will put you on a medication that will disconnect you from the etheric and lower astral planes. Okay, I, I won't say any more about that. Okay, um, transformation. No, I need to say that. If you place yourself in an environment which is ugly, of a low vibration, where there is no light, there's not going to be any growth. There's not going to be any growth, unless you're an enlightened being. Then it's a whole different ball game. But the typical ball game, <laughs> okay. Such an environment will eventually destroy the radiation of your atomic nature. 
placing you in depression and illness and eventual decay. So for this reason, you must carefully choose your environment, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Okay, I'm going to race through this in the next couple of minutes. What is required for transformation? It is aspiration. Aspiration is required for transformation. Aspiration is the desire to change yourself, to change your level of beingness. Inspiration is the source of aspiration. Inspiration is the source of aspiration. When we become inspired, it is then we begin to change we begin to aspire, aspire to change ourselves. It's like when you're around somebody that's so beautiful and so incredibly pure and so full of light, that's inspiration. And then you want to change yourself and become like that, right? A teacher can inspire us, a teaching can inspire us. Inspiration ignites aspiration from within our unfolding human soul. As we undergo the process of transformation, it is important that we realize this is a commitment in this life or lifetimes ago, a commitment that we are making to our soul. So it is suggested that each person meditates on this commitment to discover if he or she is truly ready to take the next step in his evolution. So, um, what I really recommend, you know, if you found, find yourself at that point in your life that you want to make a commitment to this next step of evolution to your soul, is to take that step during the full moon of Aries or Taurus or Gemini or the winter solstice, those four different points. If you can ask, you can ask yourself, if you as a soul are prepared to undergo the various stages of the fire of transformation in order to make your way back to Shambhala and to make a commitment of several lifetimes. There's just a couple more things I, I would like to share, but so much I'm not going to get to, but that's okay. That just means we We'll have more to look forward to later. Um, as we encounter the tensions of the path through our labors, through our travels, through our fiery experiences, we begin to see the effects reflected, you know, in our life, in our creative endeavors, in our speeches, you know, in our, um, just even the, our relationships and the way we relate to one another. Um, and so many, so many other ways. But in this thought, we can then understand how tension, when used constructively, spiritual tension, when used constructively, leads to transformation. Now, this is something that I think is important to understand. You may ask yourself, where do we get light? It's a, you know, it's a valid question. In our language, we would say from the abode of light or from the eternal source. Now, the abode of light is reflected in different fiery centers of light on Earth, you know, on the planet. These light centers are called mystery schools, schools of the ageless wisdom, but they are centers which reflect the abode of light in all their creative endeavors, their labors, their service, and advancing activities. 
we walk into the light from the darkness and begin to feel different. And let me, let me uh, end with this. There are three essential methods by which we can increase our light. One, two, three. Meditation, discipline, and service. Those are the three essential methods. Meditation, discipline, and service. Meditation you know about, but it must be steady and regular. Meditation increases the flame of your light and begins to stimulate the nucleus, the core of your chalice. If you begin to meditate and then stop, begin again and stop, your light will begin to flicker and you will find various and complicated spiritual and psychological problems. This, it is for this reason that we are told that once we begin Meditation, it needs to be steady and regular. As the light increases within our nature, we are enabled to think and speak and serve in the radiance of that light. People who really want to undergo the experience of transformation and increasing their light are those who really want to change themselves and willing to do all that is necessary to change. There are some who will not ever see a need to change. And they don't. They don't. And some who see there is a need, but they just don't or can't put the effort into changing themselves. And then we will find people, some people who want to change but are prevented from doing so because of their present conditions and situations. But those who really want transformation will do all that is necessary to bring that change about and increase their beauty and love and light and wisdom. So I suggest that you go back to reading uh, that last poem in um, the poetry, volume one by Torquem, where he talks about tests. Then listen to this lecture again, even the parts that I didn't get to, it's okay. I gave enough information to help you understand the necessity of the tests and the process of transformation and the interplay of the heart and the throat center and bringing down you know, greater fire, greater light from the spiritual triad and even greater. Okay? Okay. So I think it was important that we went over this morning. <laughs>